Welcome to the Horns in Watford, my favourite venue. I'm very happy to have uh, Steve Fipers from the Overtures with me here today to talk about his involvement with Mad, Bad and Dangerous, the Book of Drummer's Tales. Firstly, Steve, welcome. Thanks for coming. Spike, it's lovely to be here. Lovely to see you. Good to see you again. So the Overtures have played uh, many successful, um, uh, quite high-profile gigs, including some quite important weddings, one of which was uh, Elvis Costello. How did that come about? Sir Elvis. Sir Elvis. Yes, Sir Elvis well, I don't know if he's been knighted yet, but... Um, <laughs> Well, he, 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 a f long story, an agent who booked us for his wedding knew Diana Kroll's agent in, in Canada. Yeah. And uh, I said, can you find us a band to play uh, Elvis and Diana's wedding? And uh, he said, I already know them. They played at my wedding, they called the Overtures. Go on their website, have a look, let me know. And cut a long story short, we got a call to say it was going to happen. But we had to go, on the day of the gig, we had to go to um, Windsor to meet someone in a pub to sign documents and all very confidential and, time. and which we kind of expected, really. But we thought, well, what is it going to be? And, and when the, the agent came in, he said, well, look, he said, uh, it's just around the corner from here. And we were like, you know, in the neck of the woods, really. We were in a pub in the, in the countryside. I said, what do you mean it's near here? We thought we were going to travel in town, go in town, but it, it turned out that it was Elton John's house. <laughs> so we're sort of, what? <laughs> yeah, it's Elton John's house. He's uh, hosting the whole do. He's hosting it. Oh, he's not going to be there, though. Oh, yeah, he's going to be there. Is he? Oh, yeah, and David Furnish and, uh, yeah, Paul McCartney's going to be there. What? So you think, oh, no, because we're thinking, oh, it's going to be some sort of... Low key, well, no, just be Elvis, you know, yeah. and Diana, and a in a venue mates. which is uh, yeah, I might nice see Nick Lowe, which would be really cool, and a bunch of others. But finding out at that point, after you know, mid point, that it's at Elton John's house, and you know, a whole bunch of we said, well, how many guests? How many guests? Are there? You know, about 150 guests. So we went, and um, Elton John come out and met us. After we had a sound check, he said, I heard you do rock and roll, you better be good. And I said, I'll be watching you and keeping an eye on you. And the funniest bit was just before the part, well, just before we started playing, Elton John came out and stood in front of us with his arms crossed. <laughs> watching us. And we introduced ourselves, we said hello, it was a great pleasure and honour to be there. We're going to play some music. Uh, you're going to sing with us, dance with us, and so on and so forth. And uh, we start, I think, what song did we start with? God, I can't remember. Some song, and then flying in. And Elton started kicking his fingers and smiling and looking around like the man from Del Monte. <laughs> and uh, everybody joined him on, on the dance floor, including Elvis and Diana and Paul McCartney and uh, Heather Mills. And... At some point, we were playing a song where I'd play a bit of a drum solo, and, it, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. and we normally get people at it. You know, yeah. Get your hands up there, which yeah. is kind of automatic for the amateurs. And of course, the mosh pit <laughs> had Elton John, Elvis Costello, or Paul McCartney, and a whole bunch of others. A whole bunch. You know, I think Steve Buscemi, the actor, was there. You know, Chris Dippard was there from Squeeze. Yeah. So crazy. And when we finished the gig, he said, I'd like to book you for something else. And uh, he booked us for a private party first, and then he booked us, like a couple of weeks later, we did a private party at Elton's place, and we, did a, we played at his wedding. So that yeah. was really crazy. So we saw a lot of those people again, plus a load more. That must have been nerve-wracking playing at Elton John's wedding. No. Not really? No. It was all right. We had a lot of champagne. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he, he put it in the dressing room, so it was this pink stuff. Mind and you, and he, he, the it. thing is, he was so nice to us, Spike. Yeah. Uh, you, you couldn't fail. You're just doing the same thing that you've done night after night, year after year. Yeah. But you're just playing in front of some people that really, I tell you, they're a good bunch of people, yeah. a wonderful bunch of people. And um, we've played for them many, many times since. Did Lulu's yeah. 60th. And, so, and then we, did Lulu, but we support, well, we did Lulu's 60th in London, uh, and Elton yeah. um, hosted that party. And we had backing for because we had Elton. Lulu and Kiki D on backing vocals. So how yeah. nuts is that? And then we got Elton to come up and sing uh, um, 
Pimple Wizard with us. Yes. Then Lulu come up and sung uh, Shout with us. Yeah. Clang, another name drop. But, you know, that's the kind of stuff yeah. that happens to the band now and again. And now you've got, of course, um, you'll, you have the luxury of uh, full road crew, road crew and all that kind of oh, thing. Oh, yes. Of thing. For that. But there was a time, wasn't there, when, uh, well, some ten years ago, you were on the QE2. Um, this story features in the, in the book, doesn't it, where you had a problem with, um, a technical problem that only you could sort out. Which was combined with seasickness as well. Well, that's true. Uh, and even the road crew, no, no one could have saved because I was yeah. feeling I'd been really sick and bad, yeah. and nauseous. And whilst I was holding it together, um, just at the end of the song, the twang, bass yeah. drum pedal went. Yeah. And it was the spring and the washers. Something that just it just yeah. loosened up, uh, and absolute miracle. Um, we went into a Simon and Garfunkel song. You couldn't make this up. <laughs> went into a Simon Garfunkel song. So I dived down behind the drum kit to try and effect prepare. Yeah. Which I did for like four seconds. Then it went, boom, and exploded again. I thought, I can't believe this. So I'm leaning over, I'm spinning, I'm feeling ill. And this is in front of 300 uh, people on the QE2. Mainly Americans who paid a lot of money. Yeah. And yeah. To be fair, you know, of course, deep respect on the QE2, paying a lot of money to see good entertainment, and I'm... I bet you hated around. that bass drum pedal. Oh, I just <laughs> did, well, I don't even know what it was, so I won't even mention the name, but something fell yeah. to bits. Um, and eventually, whilst I was down there ferreting away, I got it just right before the song ended, and I sort of very slowly rose up like this and played the next song we played to the end and we had a big finish and we got a stand innovation so we were thrilled to bits apparently to the relief of uh, the sound guy was it who thought that you'd left the stage because you, your seasickness had returned <laughs> yeah, and you weren't coming yeah. back at all yeah Arthur, Arthur used to travel around the world with us and uh, he was convinced that I'd crawled off because the lights dipped on the stage yeah, so he was yeah. convinced that I was feeling ill had gone down and I'd crawled off the stage because I wasn't I was, I was down literally on my stomach just trying to mend this bloody <laughs> bass drum pedal and I did fix it and it stayed fixed until the end of the show yeah and then got discarded uh, <laughs> immediately presumably or yes and we set fire to it and danced set fire to it and <laughs> <laughs> in the book there's a there's a few um, a few themes that run through it partly um, difficulties drummers uh, have with things like technicalities and being ill and sick and whatever and the other one of the other things that runs through it is uh, this idea that drummers might be a little bit mad, um, or even really mad. Um, uh, Top of Heden reckons you've got to be a little bit mad to do it in the first place, uh, because you've got to spend so much time uh, playing on your own and upsetting people before you can play with anybody else. Yeah. You've got to be pretty determined to want to carry on with it. Yeah. Whereas Steve White <coughs> says it's the most sane, soulful th instrument you can play, because it's nearest to the heart and the soul and all that. Well, uh, Topper's right, and um, Steve's right. I think. It takes all sorts to make a world, and it takes all sorts to make a band, and all sorts to make a drummer. And of course, all, all those different threads come together when you're trying to figure out what it is you want to do in a band. I mean, I wanted to be a guitarist. Oh, and, right. Yeah. Uh, I'm just, it's just ridiculous. You know, most guitars are longer than me. <laughs> <laughs> Just so and I actually, yeah, I had the you know the, the hockey tick and hockey stick at school, and that was always a, a guitar for me. You know, I was the only bloke on the pitch playing, pretending that it was a guitar and all that sort of stuff. A little mirror thing, but for me, the drums was had some other sort of almost. Well, quite drums are wearing track. a hat. It's, it's it's like I don't want to do that. I don't want to. And you, you know, if you wear a hat, no, <laughs> you you know, let's have a look at that. And everyone wants to wear the hat that looks ridiculous. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, of course, drums are always those things. It's that instrument where nobody wants it uh, until you've got one, and then everybody wants to just get behind it and tap it. Back. Ooh, and oh slightly, yeah! Maybe. I mean, I did a, a straight. I did a, um, a talk at a Rotary meeting, somewhat unusually, um, a few months ago uh, in Watford, Watford Rot Rotary Club, and um, they asked me to bring my drums along. And there's several elderly people there around this table after after dinner. And my drums are this big, you know, green DW kit. It's just sitting there on its own. And I had to do a talk about Mad Bad and Dangerous and whatever. And um, they were all looking at these drums. I don't think any of any, any had ever been anywhere near a drum kit before. But they, they were looking at it like that. And I said, did anyone want to come and have a go? You know, 
It's no, 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 no. But as soon as I'd finished doing what I did, they had to go past the drum kit into the bar for after dinner drinks. Right. And they all wanted to sort of just, they couldn't resist going over and just tapping. Tapping. And tap, tapping a cymbal, tapping a cymbal. Everyone wants to tap. It just something. pulls you to it, doesn't yeah. it? So is there a sort of a, mm. is that a, a kind of um, deep-rooted um, uh, intrinsic sort of interest there, which goes back to the days when we were all communicating on, on drums and with you know, smoke signals. I think, I think and whatever. it might. It might. Or do be. they just look nice anyway, and you just want to hit them? I mean, you know, it's. Uh, well, I, I, I wanted to play the drums before I saw a, a drum kit for real. I mean, when I say for real, I mean by sitting down on a drum stool and holding two bits of wood and going right. <laughs> oh, what do you do? Are you? strike things yeah and then that's when i realized this is isn't going to be as easy as i thought it was going to be yeah you know because of course i'm left-handed and the, no one told me you're supposed to be going around the other way aren't you and this that the other but i didn't bother i just took well, one there's the hi-hat i didn't know it was called a hi-hat for ages <laughs> it's just like yeah. one of these things isn't it and all it's got a pedal it all goes up all down all right oh blimey that was one thing on his own, hand, on his own. Else. so that's yeah. that's you know Mad, if you like, and bad, and quite dangerous, you know, if you, Can be. If you drop it on someone's foot. But, you know, everything else was like, oh, this is, this is bonkers, this is bonkers. Ultimately, I think it's, I, I think that, it depends, I don't know. I, I was always drawn to yeah. drums because I loved the sound of rhythm. Yeah. Same Inside it. melody. Yeah. Yeah, within the song, within, within the, the melody. Song. Yeah. Because I, I used to, I, that's what I mean. What drew me in was the Beatles and the move and people yeah. like that. Because I just loved the way and the Stones as well. You know, the, the way it just it worked with the music you know, mm. in terms of. Um, I think I was watching Blackberry Way at about eleven years old on television mm. on top of the pops. Uh, well, I was first attracted by the drummer's dark glasses. I think it was Beth Bevan's dark. He was yeah. wearing dark glasses on one top of the pops appearance, and I thought that was really great with all his long hair and everything. And because I wanted long hair, you know, I didn't have it at 11, you know, wasn't allowed <laughs> to have long hair. And um, I thought, well, that's great, but now what's he doing? And I saw these big things he was just doing, and I thought, oh, no, that's, that looks great. And I went down to, I used to spend ages at Hammond's Music Shop down in Watford, looking at the drum kits through the window, mm. looking at the different ways they were set They're up. They're beautiful, aren't they? They are beautiful things. There's something majestic at. about them. There is something. And strangely reassuring, once, it's a bit like a car, once, once you pass the driving test, and most of us pass our driving test, not having really passed, but somebody said, go on, get out of my face. And, drive, <laughs> and, and drumming is very much like, you know, I've met so many drummers who I literally go down on my knees and sob and say, you know, you know I'm not worthy. Um, um, because at the end of the day, it's, there are so many different personalities and people, and drummers that work with different bands. Somebody, yeah. one, a drummer did say to me once, a friend of mine, said, um, no band is, 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 well, every band is as good as its drummer. Yeah. And I think that's, that's true. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, so the, our band are media. Going back to the, <laughs> uh, I beg to differ, I, in fact, I was just about to say, uh, going back to this madness thing, and, and, and you mentioned Keith Moon, mm. you seem to have this uh, ability to play like Keith Moon does in some of the songs that you do, but still keep it still keep it nice and together so it's just right for the song in, but in, in you know I've, I've said to everybody who said this to me about Keith and, and I have as much love and respect for Keith as most drummers that I know and sometimes you even pull the do you do that do you pull the moony face deliberately you know that as, you, as you're playing the no I've no idea uh, no, no, that, that hate, does actually happen well I know people tell me this and, and I, 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 local faces, I, I don't can't do it. bear Spike I can't bear looking at myself I, no, I, I hate, hate it. it you know I, I won't look at this <laughs> Some people, you know, well, might, might look at it and go, oh, not him, you know. But I, I always tried, you know, when I first saw ACDC, I, I, thought, oh, I thought, Angus Young was brilliant. Yeah. I wanted to be Angus Young on drums. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, you know, you swear yeah. about this with nod in your head. Yeah. Go, oh, keep it. Hello. Hello, Hello, darling. I like your hat. Hello, Tanya. Good to see you. How you doing? All right. Is it these? that cold that you've got to wear that coat? <laughs> In fact, uh, Mad, Bad and Dangerous did do me a favour, folks. I uh, got a discount at a drum shop, a well-known drum shop in London, big drum shop. But I was shopping for percussion 
for my theatre tour, the Bootleg 60s Science Sound Show. And they must have thought I was such a dullard coming in there. So I'd like to uh, listen to a range of cowbells and triangles, this, that, the other. And this chap looked like, you know, he was going to die of boredom when he was about 14. And he said, yeah, the cowbells are over there. And I'm like, ooh, I said, look, I said, mad, bad, and dangerous. So, yeah, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, it's a book all about, you know, top drummers. And I said, I think, is it? I said, uh, I said I'm, I'm in that. <laughs> he said, you thought you were oh, yeah? And I think, <laughs> well, mad, bad, and lying. <laughs> but I said, yeah, and sort of, I, and I, I sort of flicked it out, and, uh, yeah, and I found the photograph of me somewhere. Anyway, I found it, I went, no, oh, that's me. And he sort of went, Oh, yeah. Uh, can I show you some other areas where you can get some good cowbells? And he said, Who do you work with again? You know, and suddenly it was just like, you know, so he couldn't do rubbing nothing. his hands again, you know. And, and now he said, so I've got a discount. And I got, he said, Yeah, no, I'm sure we can do something for you, you know. And just sort of look, look at it. So, yeah, it's a really good marketing <laughs> ploy. <laughs> it saves you money. <laughs> More than what it says on the <laughs> does more than what it says on it the screen. It should say it saves it saves Trump's money. <laughs> I'm privileged. Sorry. Uh, privileged. Uh, they're known for playing several celebrity weddings. Uh, one of which, I believe, was. Uh, 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 <laughs> I'll just do that again, right? <laughs> Elvis Costello. That's just, it. Just, just, just. I promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, <laughs> nothing but the truth. So, holy God. In fact, I'm in the truth. You can't scream, so. <laughs> Reformed. That's right. I'll see you in October. <laughs> Low key, well, no, just be Elvis, you know, yeah. and Diana. And a in a venue, man. which is. Yeah, uh, I might see Nick Lowe, which would be really cool, and a bunch of others. But finding out at that point, after, you know, mid-pint, that it's at Elton John's house, and, you know, a whole bunch of... And we said, well, how many guests? How many guests? Are there? You know, about 150 guests. So we went, and um, Elton John come out and met us, after we had a sound check. He said, I heard you do rock and roll, you better be good, and I said, I'll be watching you and keeping an eye on you. And the funniest bit was just before the part, well, just before we started playing, Elton John come out and stood in front of us with his arms crossed, <laughs> watching us. And we introduced ourselves, we said hello, it was a great pleasure and honour to be there. We're going to play some music, uh, you're going to sing with us, dance with us, and so on and so forth. And uh, we start, I think, what song did we start with? I can't remember, some song and then flying in. And Elton started kicking his fingers and smiling and looking around like the man from Del Monte, <laughs> the band to play at uh, Elvis and Diana's wedding. And uh, he said, I already know them. They played at my wedding, we called the Overtures, go on their website, have a look, let me know. And cut a long story short, we got a call to say it was going to happen. But we had to go, on the day of the gig, we had to go to um, Windsor to meet someone in a pub to sign documents and all very confidential and, so and which we kind of expected, really. But we thought, well, where is it going to be? And, and when the, the agent came in, he said, well, look, he said, uh, it's just around the corner from here. And we were like, you know, in the neck of the woods, really. We were in a pub in the, in the countryside. I said, what do you mean it's near here? We thought we were going to travel in town, go in town, but it, it turned out that it was Elton John's house. <laughs> so we're sort of, what? <laughs> yeah, it's Elton John's house. He's uh, hosting the whole do. He's hosting it. Oh, he's not going to be there, though. Oh, he is going to be there. Is he? Oh, yeah, and David Furnish and, uh, yeah, Paul McCartney's going to be there. What? Oh, no, because we're thinking, oh, it's going to be some sort of in front of some people that really, I tell you, they're a good bunch of people, yeah. a wonderful bunch of people. And um, we've played for them many, many times since. Did Lulu's yeah. 60th, and so we, did Lulu, but we support, well, we did Lulu's 60th in London, uh, and Elton yeah. um, hosted that party. And we had backing vocals, we had Elton, Lulu, and Kiki D on backing vocals. 
So how yeah. nuts is that? And then we got Elton to come up and sing uh, um, uh, Pimple Wizard with us. Yeah. Then Lulu come up and sung uh, Shout with us. Yeah. Clang, another name drop. But, you know, that's the kind of stuff yeah. that happens to the band now and again. And now you've got, of course, um, you're, you have the luxury of uh, full road crew, road crew and all that kind of oh, thing. Oh, yes. Right? We've got to that. But there was a time, wasn't there, when, uh, well, some 10 years ago, you were on the QE2. Um, the story features in the, in the book, doesn't it, where you had a problem with, um, a technical problem that only you could sort out, which was combined <laughs> with seasickness as well. Well, that's true. Uh, and even the road crew, no, no one could have saved because I was yeah. feeling I'd been really sick and bad. Yeah. and nauseous and whilst I was holding it together um, just at the end of the song for twang bass drum yeah. pedal Hi, welcome to The Horns in Watford, my favourite venue. I'm very happy to have uh, Steve Fipers from The Overtures with me here today to talk about his involvement with Mad, Bad and Dangerous, the Book of Drummer's Tales. Firstly, Steve, welcome, thanks for coming. Spike, it's lovely to be here, lovely to see you. Good to see you again. So The Overtures have played uh, many successful, um, uh, quite high profile gigs, including some quite important weddings, one of which was uh, Elvis Costello. How did that come about? Sir Elvis. Sir Elvis. Yes, Sir Elvis well, I don't know if he's been knighted yet, but... Um, <laughs> well, he, 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 a f long story, an agent who booked us for his wedding knew Diana Kroll's agent in, in Canada. Yeah. And uh, I said, can you find us? And uh, everybody joined him on, on the dance floor, including Elvis and Diana and Paul McCartney and uh, Heather Mills. And at some point, we were playing a song where I'd play a bit of a drum solo. And, it, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. and we normally get people at it. You know, yeah. Get your hands up in the air, which yeah. is kind of automatic for the amateurs. And of course, the mosh pit <laughs> had Elton John, Elvis Costello, or Paul McCartney, and a whole bunch of others. A whole bunch. You know, I think Steve, you see me, the actor, was there. You know, Chris Difford was there from Squeeze. So crazy. And when we finished the gig, he said, I'd like to book you for something else. And uh, he booked us for a private party first, and then he booked us, like a couple of weeks later, we did a private party at Elton's place, and we, did a, we played at his wedding. So that yeah. was really crazy. So we saw a lot of those people again, plus a load more. That must have been nerve-wracking playing at Elton John's wedding. No. Not really? No. It was all right. We had a lot of champagne. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he, he put it in the dressing room, so it was this pink stuff. Mind and you, and he, he, the it. thing is, he was so nice to us, Spike. Yeah. Uh, you, you couldn't fail. You're just doing the same thing that you've done night after night, year after year. Yeah. But you're just playing. 